The European Union is the greatest project in modern history. A wonderful achievement. Europe is freedom. Europe means no more war. Europe is 500 million Europeans and 28 countries. We've got one coin. We live in the healthiest and safest part of the world. I'm a proud European. I can travel without borders. And I grew up in peace. Many people see Europe as the answer. I'm really in favor of the European Union and what it stands for, freedom and also freedom to, to travel wherever I want. I think it's a force to assemble des pays, une force économique, une force mm -hmm. politique. But I'm also Dutch. The small flat Holland with its unique liberal mindset. The place where my mother taught me to play tennis with endless patience. I guess you could say that Holland is my country. But what is a country? A country is people. Very different mixed people that have something in common that is unique. We share a culture. It's our books. It's a common memory of matches won and people lost. Maybe you see me as a nationalist, but in fact there are many things I don't like about my country. Be there the early dinner times, scrappy music, the royal family or carnival. But I notice something's happening to my country. Europe's becoming more involved every day. It advises our mothers how to have a baby, how much energy we can spend and the size of our strawberries. Uh, some Dutch members of parliament are aware of that fact. Yeah. Some commentators and academics are aware of that fact. But most of us are not aware of that fact. Okay. My country is working very closely together with Europe. I decided to go on a search. Is there a limit in the cooperation between Holland and Europe? What is the end goal of the European Union? And where is my voice in Brussels? I had a meeting with a member of the European Parliament who compared Holland to the European Union. Good morning. Enjoy. It's sometimes like a village, mm -hmm. but here it's much larger, uh, many more people, mm -hmm. many more distances. How would you describe it here, if, if, if Holland's a village, then how is this? I think this is a kind of uh, New York, uh, downtown Manhattan. Oh yeah, yeah, huge. Yes. Right. Yeah, yeah to understand, that's a very good question because um, to understand the European Union in yeah. a proper way, yeah. uh, you need some, uh, some knowledge and some experience. Oh, yeah? Because it's, it's, it's quite complicated. Because what is the European Union in, in, in essence? Is that something you could answer? Uh, I can answer it very cl clearly. Uh, the European uh, Union is just, or it is, a cooperation of 28 sovereign states. Sovereign states? Yes. A sovereign country is boss over its own money and laws. Here in Brussels we make the economic framework, but the details go again and stay in the individual countries. And um, But is, is details, is that, does that make a state sovereign if it handles its own details? No, you are correct. It's not the word uh, details. It makes it smaller than it is. It has to do with national politics, national priorities. National priorities. That's what matters to Brussels. But is it really about national priorities? If Brussels is getting more and more involved in our laws... How much percent of our laws here has been touched by Brussels? It is often said that 80% of the lawmaking... So although lawmaking is one of the most important parts of a country, most of our laws are not anymore made here in Holland. They come from Brussels. They make a uniform product. Same rule for each country. But besides from handing over the lawmaking, Holland can no longer decide its own budget. How is our tax money spent? A very important part of a country. 
Our parliament used to decide how our money was spent, but now the national budget is under control of the European Commission. They take care of our wallets and the wallets of the other 28 EU countries. So if that's the case, you know, even the national budgets of the, na you know, which the parliaments have to approve uh, would be one of the mo their most important tasks, that any is no longer purely um, a national matter. Um, that goes very far. Well, that goes very far. But Brussels needs money because it needs to complete its mission statement to improve the life of the European citizens. To do this, it collects money, more than 200 euros per year, from every Dutch person. This way, we European people create a budget of over 142 billion per year. With this, Brussels can get us into space, help us to improve the climate and fund thousands of other projects. But how well is all this money spent? Europe is in crisis. But the European Union thinks it needs a new building. Poland built 121 kilometers of sound wall in a remote area with no people. The only ones to have their ears protected were cows. The last five years, the European Union transferred 800 million euros directly to the government of Egypt. Reports now show that most of the money cannot be traced and the promised better democracy and human rights are not established. Despite this, the EU neighborhood policy now promised an extra 5 billion euros for Egypt. I understand that some projects go wrong. That can happen. But when I was trying to find out about these projects and possible corruption, I find it quite hard to get the documents from Brussels. Well, there are classified documents, you know, that right. form that fall under the formal classification system, and that's um, like top secret, secret, restricted. Those three need security okay. clearances. Then there is a confidential. Right. But that's the sort of really secret information. But underneath that, you also have limited documents, and they're often about ongoing discussions at the European level, and the, and the institutions say, no, but these are internal, they're preparatory. Um, but the problem right. is, if they're kept secret, um, then also national parliaments um, can't know what's going on. And if they get it, but they themselves have to keep it secret, that's problematic from a yeah. de democracy point of view. Meet the Da Vinci Project, part of the education program Lifelong Learning. What happened? Orders were illegally given to certain companies. Luckily, EU accountants are trying to find out about this corruption. And Brussels is very happy with these loyal detectives, right? This is Paul van Buitenen, a happy working accountant for the European Commission. Until he started to see something wrong in the Da Vinci project. You have official selection procedures, but you can also have secret agreements uh, where you agree with among your uh, people that certain candidates should get the money. And then you also agree how you have to dress that up so that it will match the selection criteria, mm -hmm. so that on the face of it, nothing is wrong and the selection process is going uh, according to the rules. They said, oh, but this is nothing serious or it's, it's practice or it's not, you do not see it the right way or you are a bit too narrow-minded. Yeah. You must be more flexible because otherwise you cannot spend the money. So you decided to leave it at that and do no more investigation? Uh, uh, I continued gathering material, but I didn't go to my hierarchy anymore. No. And when I had enough material, I went to the anti-fraud unit in the European Commission, which mm -hmm. is another unit not in the organization where I worked. And they didn't pick it up either. So loyal EU accountant van Buitenen saw no other option than to go to the press. A huge scandal broke out and the entire EU commission had to resign. The first and only time in history. He had to defend himself against EU law department's attacks for years. And while his fraud committing EU colleagues continued enjoying their lives and European pensions, van Buitenen didn't. The impact on your personal life is so big. One by one, all your friends will, uh, drop, uh, will drop out. You also. lost friends because of Yeah, I've lost a lot of friends. Yeah? Yeah. Prosecuting whistleblowers. Operating in secrecy. Keeping documents away from us. The untransparency and secrecy of the European Union 
amaze me. Why does a great peace project need this? We all know the story. War. Need for peace. European Union. To understand the EU, I thought it a good idea to look at its founding. So I went on a search and found quite interesting things. Paris, 9 May 1950. After a normal workday, journalists had gone home. When suddenly, a call for a press conference from French Foreign Minister Schumann. A new plan. Six countries, Holland, Belgium, France, Germany, Italy and Luxembourg, joined a common steel market. No big deal, it seemed. Just a few nations giving rights about a small subject to a new institution. The idea already at that stage was um, you know, by, by doing very specific things, originally coal and steel, it gradually expand into something much broader. And that's, of course, what, what did happen. The creation of coal and steel was a subtle attack on the European countries. What was really created was a new Europe above the nation states. How this was done? Smart and simple, by creating a supranational body. Supranational means above the countries. Already there, you had the high authority, um, and that you know later became the uh, the Commission, and it was already a supranational um, institution. Right. Um, so supranational you, meaning not just not just belonging to the member states. Right. And really, with power above the nations. I mean, I think that was the genesis of it all. You had all the seeds of um, the European Union, even as we had it today. Were already there, already there, and but much more limited in terms of their reach. Right. I mean, it was Jean yeah. Monnet who really, uh, um, very clearly had that in mind. Yeah, yeah. Jean Monnet, he was a French politician, but more, he was a lobbyist. His dream, creating one big Europe. He didn't think that countries with elections and people involved was a good idea. After several failed attempts he managed to get the big American corporations behind this idea. This powerful lobby bloc saw an easy to influence one European Commission instead of 28 separate countries. 64 years ago, the plan to create one Europe, but how did we get to the point we are today? It is all done in, in steps and um, uh, this is of course a uh, a strategy because if you've taken the first two or three steps mm -hmm. then the next step is a lot easier because then uh, the story is well we have to take the next step because otherwise all the steps we have already taken will be in vain. Step by step a new Europe was created. From coal and steel to the European community from Euratom to the Eurozone, from the Euro to a banking union. How did it get so Integration far? Integration by stealth. People get on with it and then bit by bit, you know, there are things happening and then suddenly, if it's all put together, then people on the outside, then they see it and it becomes visible uh, for the first time. But in fact, it's been going on for much longer. Growing under the radar. And we hardly notice how step by step powers are transferred to Brussels. Every day, Europe creates 10 new laws. In a country, we the people elect the parliament. The parliament creates our laws. In Brussels, it's a bit different. Laws are made by the European Commission. These are 50,000 civil servants who are appointed and not elected. So we have a situation where the parliament mm -hmm. is given legislation and works out how it might be enacted, rather than normally a parliament passes law and a civil service works out how right, it's enacted. Right. So the real power to make law and to build a body of law rests with people that we can't vote for and we can't remove. But these unappointed people need good ideas to come up with laws. Where do they get these ideas from? Lobbyists. Ten years ago, The Hague was full of lobbyists, but they left. I wanted to find out how influential they are and how many lobbyists there are. 
I decided to meet up with an expert on lobbyists. Around here you have a mixture between lobby offices, trade associations and others. Um, but you probably need some background first, so it's right, important yeah. to realise, you know, why is Brussels this lobbying capital? Partly because it's so important in terms of the laws that are passed at national level. So people don't realise 70 to 80% of all legislation that happens in the Netherlands, that happens in the UK, comes from Brussels. How much easier is it to spend your money on one capital city than 27 across all 27 member states? Yeah. So it makes far more sense. Yeah. So this has become a big hub. Um, I mean, in terms of the figures, which is quite important, there's between 15 and 30,000 lobbyists here in Brussels. Um, the figures are very unsure, partly because there's no transparency, uh, very little transparency at least. There's a register uh, for lobbyists, but unfortunately, unlike the US, it's voluntary, uh, which means if you don't want to, you don't have to. Brussels is mecca for lobbyists, and the consequences arrive to the most intimate parts of our lives. Meet TC1507, a genetically modified supercorn that keeps bugs away. But it's also dangerous for humans and animals. Research shows that genetic modification increases the risk of cancer and causes birth defects. That's why it's banned. Until now, the European Commission declares it safe for consumption, despite 19 EU countries not wanting the corn. Massive online protests from people and scientists saying it's not safe to take it. The European Commission thinks you should eat it. I wondered why the Commission allowed it, until I found out that 60% of the experts of the food group from the European Commission has direct business ties to the food industry. Enjoy your meal. So one of the biggest in Brussels is just over here, Burst yeah. Marstella, um, who has worked for, for example, the Saudi royal family after 9-11 to try and make sure uh, the blame wasn't put on them mm -hmm. um, and other savoury, unsavoury characters. Right. Uh, and they are basically hired guns. I decided to visit a hired gun who praises Brussels' democracy. It is a home. more effective system and a more, more efficient system. Right. So and and a more a more democratic in the sense that it is much easier for small and whatever interest group at home yeah. to get a position, to get a seat, to get a, a listening ear in, yeah. inside the European Commission and the Parliament, then they can get at home. Right. So I would start to, to try to influence them. Yeah. From zero. Yeah. Whereas the my opponents. Yeah. Call you. Yeah. Some of your colleagues. Yeah. Have been doing it for 20 years. Yeah. Know their ways, know the doors. Yeah. And I have to battle with them. Yeah. That's what you're saying yeah. as a citizen. Yeah. And yeah. Who, who do you think, if your gut feeling, is going to win most battles? It depends. Because. No, no. Be honest. No, no, no. Because the incumbents, stay. I have so many cases published in the book. It is a collection of what we all can know if you are studying like me almost the whole most day. Most people don't have time to do that. No, they have but to work. I have, I have yeah. done, I have done it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Say only have to read this. So they, they don't only have, have to call you. Say only, they so have to read it. Yeah, and people don't have time, or sometimes they don't have Everybody has 24 uh, hours a day. If you have an interest, I don't think it's update fair to say yourself. That. A lot of people are trying to make ends meet. People have begun to question why are we making decisions in favor of big business? Yeah. Why are we you know, giving tax breaks when actually people like me and you are suffering at home, a losing job, you know, can't find housing? There's a complete mismatch between the interests of big business and the interests of normal people. I found it kind of ironic. Under the smoke of the European Union buildings lies one of the poorest neighborhoods in Europe. One of the densest populated areas, with almost 30% unemployment and mass illiteracy. For these people, the dream feels far away. In Belgium, the deepest divided country of the European continent, that spent a record 541 days without government. Here lies the headquarters of the unification dream. A dream with at its core the original idea to favor big corporations. This is my local community of Dembors in Holland. Not a poor area, but at the local food aid program, they're running over hours. How are you to Every week, every Friday. How many are you? We are three. My mom and I were all together to get out. Yeah, ja, door the crisis had to get out of the crisis. Then he was the pilot. 
Wordt het drukker hier? Weet je daar iets van? Ja, want de eerste keer dat we hier kwamen, hadden we ja? iets van, oh, het valt eigenlijk wel mee. Ja. Maar hoe meer je hier komt, denk je van, oh, er komen toch wel heel veel mensen nou voortaan hierheen. En, ja. Ik vind het wel vervelend dat je dat zo ziet. En je denkt van, zo, er zitten toch wel veel mensen. Ja. Ja, in, in de shit eigenlijk. And while more and more European people are living under the poor line, the European Commission calls for a new industrial renaissance. It wants to make Europe even more business friendly. This means corporations can lay off you and me more easy. I wondered, where is the humanity in all this? The, the EU is a decision-making machine and it's more than that. It's also a monitoring machine where the decisions are being implemented. Why do you Europe... choose the word machine, if I may ask? Well, because that's what it does on a daily basis. It turns out policies, it implements policies, it monitors the, the, the implementation of, of them. I was surprised to learn that the EU is some kind of machine that grows step by step under the radar. I think that the European Union um, contribute to the union of different uh, uh, members of uh, different countries and uh, yeah. make the, a good work on the politically and uh, economically uh, development of uh, all the countries of the yeah. European Union. But where are you and me in Europe? How can we influence Brussels' process? We can do this from the European Parliament. But do they really represent us? We men. We have to be honest, we like our porn. About half of the time we spend online, we like to admire natural phenomena. But the EU thinks you should not. What happened? A member of the European Parliament tipped the European Commission, saying, let's ban porn in all media. So a report was made called, let's ban porn in all media. Oh no, there is one thing you should know about Brussels. They don't always call the things exactly the way they are. So a report was made called, eliminating gender stereotypes. But deeply hidden, it said, ban all forms of pornography in the media. This could include sexual communication between me and my girlfriend. It was a done deal until we got angry and sent thousands of mails to the members of parliament saying, I want to keep my porn. Are you nuts? But us influencing Brussels, that's not the idea. So some members of parliament went to the IT department. They added a spam filter to all our mails for the word porn. So our protests were never seen because of this trick. Social media exploded and the porn ban was not introduced. We saved our porn. When the European Parliament does have a good idea, it cannot make laws, it cannot appoint or elect the European Commission, it cannot inquire the European Commission, and many times it doesn't have access to secret documents. The Parliament is my place in Europe, but as we see, it doesn't always listen. It's kind of ironic because we're the ones paying their salary. And not a bad one, I might add. I found a member of parliament who agreed to be transparent about his salary. That's my paycheck. Let's see. Well, you can... And this is basically what we get. That's, well, let's say 8,000. Like your salary, yeah. Yeah, that's the base salary. And we get our uh, daily allowance. That's 300 euros. There was also like an extra of like 4,000 per month on expenses or something? Or is that... Yeah, and it's meant basically for uh, not having an office. You can use it and you never have to explain where you spend it on. 766 members of parliament get more than 3 million euros per month for office expenses. But there's more. Traveling is also paid. You get paid for, the, uh, for how long you travel and for uh, basically the distance between the two. Right. But if you go by car, then you're hitting the jackpot. Working for the European Parliament gets you a monthly salary of 18,600 euros. Not a bad income, especially if you take into account that most of them hardly pay income tax, because they live in Brussels. Next to getting a royal salary, they receive money for a secretary, 21,000 euros per month. The European Parliament is on constant travel between Belgium and France. All Parliament members and 47 trucks of files travel more than 400 kilometers. Parliament members receive another 650 euros in cash. But of course, in the back of a limo you need to look good, 
So in the end of the month, a free EU haircut awaits them. We have an enormous car park. And they are free to use? They're free to use, yes, right. for us as members of parliament. Like, there are drivers available. Right. I decided to try it for myself, see if the drivers do drive you around. But the driver doesn't want to take me. I have to go for the common people's option. It's called the European Parliament, heart of European democracy. But I'm not sure if I really feel represented by them. I guess I still feel more attached to my own country. I was wondering, maybe my national parliament can keep Brussels sharp. You know, developments in Brussels go at such a high speed that uh, it's, it's really difficult for, for national parliaments to, uh, to really follow what is happening. The average MP sees Europe and European Union and development yeah. in European Union as something that we as a small country cannot stop, can hardly influence. A feeling that is unstoppable. Until we came in. It was time for a European constitution. And this time, we had a say. In a binding referendum about transferring more powers to Europe or not, government, corporations and the mainstream press all campaigned heavily for the constitution. And that paid off. Polls showed a clear yes. And the expectation was that the people of the Netherlands would support the idea of a European constitution. Uh -huh. But the Dutch people didn't seem so convinced, and the no movement started to win momentum. And then they played all their cards. Scaring the people. Yeah, scaring in Scaring which way? that if you do not support the, the European constitution, then the economy will come to a stop. Literally, one of our ministers said, lights will go out. But this time, there was no stopping us. The unthinkable happened. The constitution was denied in Holland, but also in Ireland, Denmark and France. We people won. Or did we? Things looked very grim. Uh, the outlook was very grim. And yeah. these member states where the referendum had gone uh, the wrong way for the European constitution could not, of course, uh, uh, say, listen, too bad, but we're going to rectify it anyway. And then the commission said, let, let, let's stop the process. We need to come up with something different. And yes, they came up with something completely different. The Lisbon Treaty. How different was this Lisbon Treaty? It is the constitutional treaty in a different wrapping. You and me didn't want more Europe, and we denied the constitution. So this time, we were not asked about our opinion. We've been deceived. We've yeah. been fooled. Absolutely. And obviously, uh, the, the government and uh, the parties supporting the Lisbon Treaty were afraid of voters. The voters saying no again. The Prime Minister said, well, if, if Holland votes no, then I will look like a fool in Europe. Well, was that fair to the people that said no? No. It wasn't? No. No? No. It's a scam. Yeah? Yes. Scammed. Are you and me being scammed? We must recreate the European family in a regional structure. Called it may be the United States of Europe. If this is the wish of the Europeans,
and machinery erected to carry that wish to full fruition. Well, I think all the um, individual European countries need each other in an economic way as well as in a political way because of the, um, the, the, the original meaning of the European Union to prevent another world war. I was curious about a new opinion. How do people outside the EU see these developments? I decided to go on a trip. Switzerland, not part of the EU. But why didn't they join us? I hope to get a better understanding of our own situation through the eyes of the Swiss people. Why are the Swiss not part of the EU? Sie we wären froh, das. wenn wir zu Ihnen kämen, zu ja? EU, oder? Ja, aber wir möchten nicht. Ja, wieso, wieso nicht? Wir haben das Gefühl, dass wir da nicht mehr machen können, was wir wollen. Okay. Wir können jetzt selber abstimmen. Wir gehen am Sonntag abstimmen, dann sagen wir, das wollen wir und das wollen wir nicht. Yeah. And the, mayor decided, okay. the Swiss have a direct democracy, meaning they can vote all the time on many issues. To learn more about this, I set up a meeting with the chief editor of a large newspaper. Direct democracy means that really the, the citizens are the chiefs. You know, they actually are in charge here. They're responsible. They have the highest power in their hands. Do you think as a uh, Swiss citizen, you have more power than I do as a member of European definitely, Union. Definitely, absolutely, yeah, yeah. definitely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. For example, we vote on even a tenth of a percent of the uh, VAT tax, mm -hmm. for example, whereas in, in Germany they could change the tax when I lived there from, you know, they could raise it from 3% without right. any any kind of uh, of, of plebiscite or, 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 uh, or vote on the votation. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, I would say, that's a, a, a very specific result of our of direct democracy and more control of, um, of the budget, of what politicians uh, do with the tax money. The people here have an absolute veto on every law. And they can vote on many issues. Do you want a new military airplane? No? Do you want more holiday? Do you want state earnings of gambling to be used for public interests, like schools and parks? I was wondering if it's maybe difficult to do business. But it doesn't look like it. Switzerland has the best economy in the world an unemployment rate lower than 3% and not a bad minimum wage. About 3,000 euro. 3,000 euro is the minimum yes, wage? Yes. Right. And that's not too We are talking now bad. about having 4,000 francs. Okay. As an initiative starting to right. uh, having 4,000 francs and 3,500 euro a month as a minimum wage. In 1999, the Swiss could vote on this question. Do you want to join the European Union? Ah, but why not? It's maybe better for Schweiz. Huh? It's maybe better for Schweiz, if we don't have EU. Yeah? Yeah. But you need the EU to... Yeah, so a little bit is not bad, but if too many people talk together, then it doesn't go well. No? And that's why the Schweiz are up. And that's a strange situation. Ah, yeah, that's a strange situation. That's a strange situation. Yeah, it's just one. Wie, wie so das Axel zu Nobelix, das kleine Dorf. Axel zu Nobelix, ja. ja, das kleine Dorf. Ja, ja, ja. Rundherum ist Europa. Oh ja? Ja, so. An important voice in Switzerland about the European Union is that from Christoph Blocher. He's the founder of Switzerland's biggest political party, whose main topic is keeping Switzerland sovereign. Die Schweiz ist eine wohlgeordnete Anarchie. Ah oh, ja. Sie können die Schweiz anschauen. Von außen ist die Schweiz mehr Ordnung als Chaos. Ja. Aber für die Politiker hat es etwas Chaotisches. Okay. Sie wollen bestimmen, sie sind gewählt. Kaum sind sie gewählt, sagt das Volk, das, was du da entschieden hast, das wollen wir nicht. Und jetzt ist das eine Frage, glaubt man an die eigenen Bürger? Glaubt man, dass wenn die abstimmen, dass es gut rauskommt oder nicht? So would you consider Holland a sovereign country? Every member state of the European Union yeah. has given away uh, some, of the, some of his uh, uh, sovereignty to, to Brussels. Right. Some of them have, um, have adopted 
a, f a currency, a new currency. They've given up their own currency. So therefore, Holland is, of course, not a, a fully sovereign country anymore. No? As a member state of the European Union, no. The voice of the people respected. The highest minimum wage in Europe and the ability to make their own decisions. I learned a lot in Switzerland. I realized here even more that I'm part of this big EU bloc. Seeing the Swiss people deciding their own fate, are they a bit nationalistic? Or did they perhaps realize better than us what it means to be a country? I'm going back to Holland, the proud Holland, now part of the big EU bloc. Seeing the independence of the Swiss, it made me think, maybe it's time for us to take some powers back from Brussels. Can we do that? Is that possible? Very difficult, um, because everybody needs to agree. So you can't just have one member state, for example, the, the UK or the Netherlands, for that matter, yeah. um, saying that they want to take back certain, certain areas. That's one problem I see. The second problem is that for very many policy areas, it's all mixed up. There isn't a, a sharp dividing line. One side is European, the other side is national, and that you can simply remove something from the European and put it back in the national box. So if putting powers back in the national box is not the route, what is? Mr. Barroso, the Commission President, yeah. said a couple of years ago, we are building the first ever non-imperial empire. They're this, building an empire yet this year? There's no question. That's exactly what they're trying to do. Yeah. You know, they, they, they are trying to subsume the nation state. Creating a central organization by subsuming the nation state. Has it ever been done before? There have been examples of people or movements who tried to get that. Mm -hmm. And those are the dark ages of our history. Fascism. Communism in the Soviet way, right. uh, Napoleon. This is at least uh, a more open, less violent uh, way. A less violent way to create an empire. Will Jean Monnet's dream become reality? A federal Europe. How far are we? Take, for example, ESM. European Stability Mechanism. Das Grundkapital beträgt 700 Milliarden Euro. Der ESM kann also beliebig nachfordern, unbegrenzt. Und wir sind dann, Sie Artikel 9, bedingungslos und unwiderruflich verpflichtet zu zahlen? Der ESM verfügt über volle Rechts- und Geschäftsfähigkeit für das Anstrengen von Gerichtsverfahren. Der ESM, sein Eigentum, seine Finanzmittel und Vermögenswerte genießen umfassende gerichtliche Immunität. Wenn der ESM ruft, dann muss es schnell gehen. Immerhin sieben Tage. Bei den normalen Bankenlaufzeiten müssten wir also innerhalb von vier Tagen den Überweisungsträger ausfüllen. At the introduction of the Euro, bailouts were strictly forbidden. Now we have to come up with billions of Euros in four days. No questions asked. No right to refuse. I really don't think that the average voter in this country is aware of the risks that are involved in the uh, programs that are there to basically secure the euro. In Germany, 200 academics filed a lawsuit against the ESM because their claim, with the ESM, Germany would stop to be a democracy. They lost their appeal. In Holland, there was little debate. Also, the euro was quite quickly accepted. That's very handy. We have one currency which we can pay with, so I think it's a pretty good thing. Good it makes thing. life easier. It might make life easier, but was the euro only a financial step? If you start uh, a common coin, you need, you need to have the instruments to govern. To govern that. Yes. So could you say in, in a sense that maybe the introduction of the euro was also a political step in a way, because you needed to... The, the, to be honest, the, the introduction of the euro is a political oh, step. Yeah. If you have a common currency, yeah. you need a common economic politics. In 2001, one of the creators of the euro, Romano Prodi, said, I am sure the euro will oblige us to announce a new set of economic policy instruments. It's politically impossible to propose that now, but someday there will be a crisis and new instruments will be created. 
We see all these instruments created now, from ESM to banking union, all speed up by the euro crisis. And um, the, the crown on this particular uh, corporate interest project as it has become was the introduction of the eurozone, uh, the euro as a monetary instrument which allowed um, corporate interests by means of state actors uh, to capture uh, national political agendas and transform national political economies into um, basically uh, uh, neo-conservative or neo-liberal uh, kind of entities. You say the, the euro is a business coin. Uh, absolutely. If you accept that and you take that as a lens, uh, glasses, and you start looking at what is currently going on in the euro crisis, mm -hmm. the way in which the euro crisis is being managed, um, the kind of um, institutional remaking that is being enacted in, in Ireland, uh, in Portugal, uh, in Spain, in Italy and in Greece in particular, uh, it is an erosion of uh, social rights. Boundaries are being redrawn uh, in order to uh, serve, again, the interests of uh, large corporations which want only one thing, and it is flexible labour markets, no taxation uh, and um, um, uh, integrated markets. And that's basically what is currently being constructed on the back of uh, the Euro crisis. It is very complex. Het is dan Europa, maar het verschil zit, zit, is zo ontzettend groot. Ja. Dus ja, dat is, hadden we nooit moeten doen. Het is het idee dat je het niet meer in eigen hand hebt. Dat je, af, dat je daarvan afhankelijk bent en dat je daar uh, naar moet luisteren. En dat is op zich allemaal niet erg. Nee. Als je ziet dat er ook echt verbetering in komt. Maar aangezien het helemaal allemaal niet beter wordt, nee. vind ik het een beetje angstig eerlijk gezegd. Some of us find it scary, but maybe we just don't get it. Because who are we to go against the opinion of the Norwegians? The Nobel Peace Prize for 2012. The jury report stated for bringing 60 years of peace and democracy to Europe. In the end, we decided to live together and may other continents follow. I was incredulous, in fact. I just thought this, you know, I just... Because I think it was Obama first, you know, in his first, first year, and then the European Union, you just think, come on. And also, given the democratic deficit, given lots of other things, uh, the economic crisis, and also re reactions, responses to that. No, I also, timing-wise and everything. Mass austerity, a euro crisis. Voters unsure. Trust in governments low. But we do have a Nobel Prize. The, the European project, and especially the monetary union, is currently injuring um, Eurozone citizens. And now you're not only injuring them, them by um, austerity measures, yeah. you're also insulting them. I thought it was insulting to the European citizens yeah. to give the European elite this prestigious prize. The highest form of praise, a Nobel Peace Prize, a proof of greatness. And I found out it's better not to be critical about these achievements. When I told my friends I was going to make this film, a critical film about the European Union, they were not really getting it. Didn't Europe bring us peace and prosperity after all? Criticizing Brussels gets you a label. Populist. In 2014, a Dutch report stated, Euroskepsis is a matter of principle is only seen among right-wing extreme populist parties. Criticizing the EU, and you're a right-wing populist. They've hijacked the word Europe. The flag, the anthem, Herman van Rompuy, that's not Europe. No, but if you criticize uh, the European Union, uh, that can quickly make you like, uh, you know, like a, a nationalist almost. Well, they can try and do that, yeah. and they've tried to do that, yeah. but, but they're not winning with me. Huh. You know, I mean, I honestly will lay claim to you here today that I'm a, greater, I'm a greater European than they are. Oh, yeah? Because I think I know what Europe is and they don't. What is Europe, no? Europe is the most diverse set of people within a small geographical area that exists anywhere in the world. And it's actually what makes Europe the most fascinating, interesting continent on the whole of the Earth. It's a fantastic place. And we need to have uh, well-informed debates without being put into straight jackets of anti-European, pro-European or anti-Dutch or whatever. Yeah. Many 
people who are so-called pro-Europe, they think this is all about the, the war. You, you see, we don't have peace in Europe since 1945, at least in most parts of Europe, mm -hmm. because of the EU. No? The, the, no. There are many other reasons. There was, I mean, look at the Cold War. That was one of the reasons why we had to stick together as a bloc and we had the US backing us. People bring in all kinds of ideologies and emotions mm. in the debate, whereas it is our job as analysts or your job as journalists mm. to scrutinize developments just as they are. The most important voice of EU journalism is the national news. They make the mind of the people. But when I watch the news, I hardly see any critical report. Why bring only positive EU news? Looking for the balance. Every Which single balance? the balance in reporting about Europe. Right. Many journalists, colleagues, think it's very attractive to report on, look, it's a waste of money. So you, what you're doing is you're this looking is at what other people are bringing yep. news and then you're reacting to that. No, I, I rather look at our own uh, balance. Because so, you just said I'm looking at what other people are yeah. negative. I'm trying to balance. No. You're balancing for the kind of negative reporting in, in other areas from other people and you want to... I don't want to put it like negative. Uh, I'm not positive I'm about the European you. Union. I, I don't. Uh, it's, it's, it's my personal opinion. I'm very cynical about this whole parliament and this whole European Union. When did you do a report on the lobbying here, for instance? 15,000 lobbyists working in, in Brussels. I think I have not made a report on lobbying. No? no? Why not? I think it's normal part of daily life of doing politics. We're not supposed to criticize Brussels, so nobody really criticizes Andy Klom. You know, Andy Klom. Right? This is Andy Klom, Holland's most important unknown politician. His job? The ambassador of the EU at the national level. Th this embassy, uh, the representation of the European Commission here mm -hmm. in the Netherlands, in The Hague, mm -hmm. reports back on a daily basis what is happening in Parliament, what is the opposition thinking, where is the government uh, working on. Part of his staff is now regarded as a spy in the Netherlands on developments that are taking place. But don't only states have embassies? Or maybe it's a proper sign of where we are at this point. We see the project rising. Jean Monnet's dream is becoming reality. A federal Europe is on the horizon. At some point, I think we could go to a point of the United States yeah. of Europe. I think that so a common the... foreign and security policy uh, would allow the EU mm -hmm. to have the biggest seat at any table. EU Vice President Reding now calls for a true political union to be put on the agenda. She says, I expect the United States of Europe before 2020. Her prestige project is a public prosecution office. This will, of course, serve above the national ones. It will be able to give direct orders to countries on which person to prosecute and how. Also, the talks of a European army are getting more intense. A European public prosecution service and a European army. Should we want this? And aren't these normally part of a sovereign country? We should never become in this, end up in a situation where the EU is eating up the member states. Are they eating up the member states right now? Uh, the, the way the, the current discussions about the future uh, of the EU is uh, developing, yes. Countries eaten up. How democratic is this? All the while you're members of the European Union, there is nothing the Dutch or British voter can do uh, to change. Uh, climate change legislation, employment legislation, all the things that we should vote on in general elections and debate in our countries have now ceased to be even discussed. Yeah. Because we've transferred the government um, of our countries here. The Netherlands is no longer a democracy. Um, it has fallen under the dictatorship of the European Commission The 
the European Union institutionally at the moment is in my eyes the opposite of, of a democracy. It's, 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 a, um, it's a democracy without people. So if you don't live in a democracy anymore, what do we live in? A, a, a technocracy. Form? It's a technocracy. What is a technocracy? A technocracy is a, um, um, a, a political entity in which collective decision making is no longer subject to democratic accountability. As good citizens, we vote. But why, actually, if the people we choose are not the ones in power? And the ones in power don't need my voice or yours. A hundred billion neurons connected by a hundred thousand billion synapses will have an enormous impact on the health of the aged. European researchers propose a radically new approach to study the human mind. The Human Brain Project will put Europe at the forefront of neuroscience, the most mysterious phenomenon of the universe, the human brain. The goal of the Human Brain Project is to improve the life of the European citizens. The EU trying to map and improve our brains. Should we want that? We have to thank you because you are defending European values and European principles and democracy. A new delegation of the European Union and the European parties and the European Parliament shall come on this place until you have won your fight. Never ever give up. The EU acting as a guardian angel. I learned a lot in this journey. I learned. It's gone quite far. We have gone quite far quite quickly. In terms of the issue areas that are now being dealt with, um, in terms of their sensitivity in the national context, you know, asylum, immigration, criminal law, budgets, yeah. all that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, we, it's, gone, it's gone quite far. What can we do to get momentum back for us? How do we prevent big corporations calling the shots in Europe? I believe in people. Do you? Or do you want decisions about your life and mine to be taken more and more by these politicians? It is time to become involved and take matters in our own hands. We don't need a corporate EU. We need a Europe for the European people.